where are you in relation to uh, the film scoring scene today? And, and, and I was wondering what your feelings are on the condition of film scoring today. Well, I just finished uh, a movie uh, with uh, uh, Julie Tamer, who I, I work with uh, quite often. Uh, we uh, just uh, finished our third uh, uh, Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, it's uh, Midsummer is a special, special play because uh, it starts out with uh, as being a tragedy and uh, set in Athens. And uh, for all intents and purposes, the audience uh, thinks uh, they're going to be in for a rough ride. And then uh, abruptly, it it becomes a a wild comedy uh, Uh involving a young love. And uh, so uh, it's one of the most uh, unique uh, Shakespeare experiences. And uh, and, uh, from a composer's point of view, it's... uh, uh, challenging, and uh, it, it was very specific in writing where he wanted certain songs to be sung, as well as dances to be played, and uh, um, uh, it um, it's just uh, one of the great uh, challenges in, in the uh, Shakespeare canon, and uh, uh, this uh, latest uh, film is one of uh, I'm especially proud of. One gets one gets so much uh, working on these classical pro- uh, projects because uh, of uh, you know it's like an onion. Uh, every time uh, there's another layer revealed in Shakespeare's work. You know, you hear about this about Shakespeare and the, the little bit of Shakespeare that I have studied in my life. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you everything is there. I mean, all the all the building blocks of drama, they were all there in Shakespeare's work. And uh, I'm wondering from a musician's standpoint if uh, you find that the case with, with the musicality of Shakespeare as well. I am a contaminator in various meters. If you uh, break out of the shackles of uh, his instructions, uh, there's, uh, there's a huge world there. And... Uh, the, the beauty about uh, this Shakespeare is that it has that um, uh, dimension uh, where it's completely fulfilling uh, the, the, yeah. uh, um, the process. It's like locking you yourself in a room and you can uh, get what you can or being out in an amazing natural surroundings like uh, a mountain or, or a or at the, the, the seaside or something. It's, uh, it gives you map back even more than you're giving it, you know. And maybe this is a challenge with, or the primary challenge with any uh, piece of music you write for material. Um, <clears throat> but we, we talked about the musicality of Shakespeare and the iambic pentameter and the kind of the lilting quality of that. Is it a particular challenge to write music that complements that and doesn't compete with it? Oh, yes. You have to, um, I like to say, uh, dance between the raindrops uh, mm-hmm. and, and working with Shakespeare. You know, being that this is my third film, uh, Titus uh, on Tempest and Midsummer Night's Dream, um, I find that, um, you know, this, this is, you don't want to trample any great uh, artist performance with the uh, like uh, Anthony Hopkins and uh, uh, Titus, or or, or, or Helen Mirren and uh, um, the Tempest, you know, uh, the, these people, they're complete um, artists, and it's a complete package. So you have to n- learn how to support all the rooms, or uh, as an accompanist, uh, or as a as a bed, uh, as a world. Where they uh, they can uh, uh, be uh, comfortably supported, not not uh, be be distracting. Mm-hmm. Sometimes uh, <laughs> you want to pin spot some words and highlight some words and phrases by a, a musical emphasis. But uh, <clears throat> in general, it, it's a very 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 tricky and uh, um, uh, subtle path you have to take with uh, Shakespeare's stuff. Of course, 
Uh, other times you can be, you know, huge and orchestral, like uh, I was in uh, Titus, uh, especially the first few, later made uh, famous by uh, the, the movie um, 300, that, that uh, um, um, borrowed illegally uh, on my music at that point. But you can see it can have a range between very, 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 very subtle and very, very big and um, and uh, cinematic. Well, you know, I, 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 I whenever I speak to composers, I always discuss where film composition is today, and and I uh, I'm a huge film score fanatic. Um, and personally, me when I listen to the the soundscape in film today, I miss the 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 melodic quality of it the melody of it the the kind of recognizability um it seems to be more and more used as an extension of sound effects now mm-hmm. and i'm wondering if you see that and if you're troubled by it no i'm not troubled by it at all um uh if it's um if it's excellent art it's excellent art and uh, for example um the the t v series uh, a few years back, um, recently, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, I don't know, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know, uh, include uh, Better Call Saul as, a, as the same situation, but uh, the composer there was uh, using sound as sonority, not particularly melody all the time, and uh, it was very, very, very well crafted and very well supported in the in the uh, television series. Um, melody is, um, you know, um, especially in these te- television series, uh, melody is not de- uh, don't, uh, neglected. And uh, it always goes with the subject matter. Um, if it's um, if it's something that's um, usually based on romance and based on those type of principles, uh, you often get uh, melody that goes with it, as, as well as in my work, you know. Uh, it's true there was uh, lots of uh, big melodies in Michael Collins and uh, the Batman movies, and uh, but but yet um, and even in Heat there was melodies, but but not as much. But when you get to a movie like Frida, it's all melody, it's all tunes, you know. Mm-hmm. It just depends so, on what so, the project calls for. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but I don't lament too much about that because every director, um, you know, has to make, make a decision whether it's driven by a melody or not. But you know, it, it's refreshing when it is because it adds so much character to, yeah. to, to the to, to the project. But uh, some of my er- early projects, like uh, Alien Three. Short of the very end, uh, um, the melody wasn't an important aspect. It was more of making the orchestra uh, get under your skin and, and really uh, be a, a vehicle for a fright and, um, and make us feel uneasy. Uh, and boy, does it ever. I mean, that score, its I think it's one of the most defining scores of that era, um, and that took you something like it, a, a year of experimentation to create that, didn't it? Well, David Pinter was uh, nice enough to um, let me do my thing, and he didn't uh, interfere. And uh, he wanted me to con- control, uh, compose a complete score, which is electronic, first uh, and complete. No temp music. He, he didn't use any temp music. Uh, so, so that at, in, in the end, I composed and orchestrated that electronic score with some some of the uh, electronic elements back into the uh, acoustic orchestra. So it had an un, uh, unearthly uh, uh, feel to it, uh, and uh, short of the last melody where Ripley ju- uh, jumps in the lead. Uh, it's it's not it's not particularly melodic. Yeah. Well, I know I know that was a very difficult shoot for him, uh, and I, I've read. Him, yeah. Yeah. It, it, did did you experience any difficulty with, or in general, with studio people meddling with the music and offering notes that aren't helpful? 
<laughs> yes, uh, but it wasn't. Um, it wasn't overwhelming. As long as uh, Fincher was around, uh, things went went pretty smooth. As soon as he disappeared there towards the end, uh, I was, uh, you know, it was me versus them. Yeah. Until then, everything was smooth. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple other specific scores, and you mentioned one of them. Uh, one of my all-time favorite films is Heat. Um, and I'm thinking of a, a scene when you know that you have a film in the, the kind of the centerpiece scene, it has to work, like the coffee shop scene, uh, that uh-huh. you wrote something like a, a, a two-minute piece very subtly underscoring that moment. Uh Tell me, tell me about the process of of creating that because that's a scene particularly where uh, you absolutely do not want to interfere with with, with the uh, combination of those two actors face to face for the first time. Well, um, I haven't seen the movie uh, since since I wrote it, but um, but I, if I recall. What I wanted to do is um, throughout the, the movies a lot of um, electronic, uh, like uh, electric guitars, and uh, mixed with string quartet, mi- mi- mixed with uh, percussion and, and vocal effects. Um, quite often, my voice, uh, and um, and this is the scene where the. Uh, Two American icon actors are, are finally in the scene together. I approached it like I was doing the Lincoln uh, um, Douglas debates, something like that. You know, hmm. something like was completely Americana, taken from the lineage of my teacher uh, Aaron Copeland. Very, hmm. very, very uh, stately. Uh, stately and uh, uh, elegant, uh, and um, to play against the fact that these guys are killers and, and cops, and they're gonna, one of them are going to kill it, one or another at one point. So I thought it was neat to make it completely an American experience, uh, Americana experience in a classical sense that we're used to when we see great statesmen or great events in American history. So um, that was a wild, wild idea, but I think uh, it was uh, pretty successful. It heightened heightened the uh, icon-esque role they they play in in American life, uh, life at that time. Pacino and De Niro, you know? Yeah, I absolutely agree because I mean it could have it could have been music that <clears throat> played up the the thriller aspect of it, but I found the music to be almost very contemplative and melancholy in a way, almost like it was th- about that tragic inevitability that awaited them both. That's right. Uh, That's right. Yeah, it was beautiful, beautiful. And when you're when you're working with somebody like Michael Mann, and I think of his films and music well, is such an as uh, public enemies. So I work with him again, you know. Yes, recently. and his music is such an essential part of the texture of his films. He has to have a he has to have a very special musical language with you, I would think. Well, he. he He's a, um, a music fanatic, and uh, he he loves music. He, he's as the project is developing, he's listening to a million and one things that he he'd like his um, uh, you know movie to sound like, and um, and he's so devoted to the uh, musical aspect of the thing that sometimes it's frustrating because uh, he wants something very very specific and uh, it's uh, tough to find it because he often changes his mind. It's his right. His right to change his mind. He's the director. He is, it is his project, his script. 
uh, his idea. But uh, a composer has to be prepared for that, uh, uh, an idea that, you know, you're in his world and you have to adapt. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the other director that you've worked with frequently, besides uh, Mr. Mann and, and Julie, uh, Neil Jordan, who you've done yes. remarkable work with. I was listening to The Butcher Boy earlier today, and it's so beautiful, that score. Um, but also, you, I think you started with him on Interview with a Vampire, and yes. was that... Was that a project that, uh, I mean, I seem to remember, because I've always been obsessed with film scores, was that a project that you came on to almost last minute? Not last minute, yes, yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Fenton uh, was uh, doing the score, really. And uh, they weren't happy with uh, the the final product. And uh, uh, George Fenton was asked if he can stay and finish the project, but he couldn't. He had another uh, um, project to uh, attend to. So uh, the whole movie was left in, fell in my lap, so to speak, and uh, <clears throat> I had like mm, nearly three weeks to do everything, uh, compose two and a, two hours of music in three weeks. So uh, it was... Uh, more of a um, reflex, reflexive process than a reflective process, and I mm. had to just to reflex my reflex muscles and just just go into the day knowing I'm, I'm going to compose four mi- minutes of music a day or something like that, or ten minutes of music or two reels of music, uh, and. Uh, the speed, I think, uh, of the um, creative process uh, worked on my side because they didn't have uh, much time to muck with it and uh, change, make changes. I just had to get from the beginning to the end and uh, I based my uh, musical ideas on the fact that uh, you have a, a chronological aspect with uh, vampires you can, um, they live a long time. So, um, uh, let's say the music went from uh, a very sort of a medieval sound uh, with Latin and children and things uh, going through the harpsichord, um, the classical period of music, and going into the invent, uh, the modern piano and, and uh, modern orchestral music. And then through uh, <clears throat> even the uh, uh, rock band um, and the, uh, for the devil, uh, devil at the end. So, so um, it, it had a chronological imperative to it uh, mm-hmm. as a the, the backbone of uh, what I was writing. So uh, it was a very simple um, uh, plan, um, uh, you know. Uh, but um, I was able to. Uh, Completed, and I was very. I'm still very happy with that score. Oh, it's fantastic! You know, I, I mean, it's, it works in uh, concert. Uh, you know, it, it works for what the movie uh, as well. Mm. That that fascinates me. How you know you think about screenwriters and directors and actors doing research into a project whether it be in investigating time period or the, uh, the particular region of the world where the story takes place or what have you, can, can you talk about any of your credits and, and, and that kind of research that went into it so people can understand what, what goes into building a score like that? Well, sometimes research research gets you so far because uh, anytime you research something, you realize uh you need about uh, a few years to research uh, anything to do anything properly in, in another person's culture. So you um, often uh, you have a feeling, let's say, uh, on a movie like uh, Michael Collins, which is here the most important political um, 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 personality in the history of Ireland. And uh, 
and I was uh, asked to write uh, music on his behalf, you know, in the movie. I don't know the history of Irish music and, and uh, all the uh, folkloric uh, um, veins and avenues uh, of, uh, of that music. So I just um, made a general sketch in my head of uh, how he wanted to sound, and I hope uh, that was um, appreciated uh, on the Irish side, and it was. It's um, beloved over there. Um, but um, <clears throat> there was no way of avoiding the fact that it had to sound from that world in mm-hmm. Ireland. No. And um, Neil was more interested in the drama of it all, the Shakespearean uh, aspect of uh, Michael Collins and uh, De Valera uh, and how um, the musical approach to drama was very important to him. And to me, it was a special uh, project because I, I read the script and I said to Neil Jordan at the time, you know, I'm missing the female quality in this um, in this uh, script. Mm. Uh, it was more female involvement, female um, uh, contribution to the revolution. And so I started the whole score, um, set the music in Gaelic or Irish, uh, and uh, and not in the English language to begin with. So you hear um, a non-English language during the Easter Rebellion. Um, by the way, a- April uh, is now a hundred years anniversary. Uh, April um, 1916. So it's now approaching April 2016. So it's a mm-hmm. hundred year anniversary of that event. So. Um, uh, I, uh, I composed it for uh, Sinead o- uh, O'Connor and orchestra. Right. So when uh, men were shooting up men in the rebellion, um, and you you hear women, and you hear the Ang- Irish language, and uh, you hear the word, the very words used from the uh, Easter Rebellion in the Irish language. Wow. That's a stunning score. What, did you think in terms of, for Michael Collins and his struggle, did you think in terms of creating something anthemic? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, um, I, more than once, um, uh, anthemic, uh, qu- anthemic qualities run through the whole film musically. But um, uh, I actually had to write uh, a new uh, Irish national anthem. Mm. And, you know, and uh, that was very funny. <laughs> uh, I had to, I had to sound like it was written in the early twenty twentieth century, like uh, Elgar or something. Uh, uh, John Fields, those uh, composers that came from that uh, era. So I actually wrote a new national anthem for Ireland in that movie. Gosh. Not used uh, by the Irish uh, nation, but uh, but I, it served well in the movie. The last question I usually ask uh, my composers, uh, I'm always curious to know, if you taught a class on film composition, uh, what examples throughout history, and you can use your own as well, would you would you use, which tracks or particular films or cues, would you use to teach various lessons? There's a big divide between uh, uh, writing scores that uh, are driven by melody. For example, uh, Nino, Nino wrote uh, uh, scores for film. In general, is uh, uh, driven by melody. Godfather, Romeo and Juliet, uh, La Strada, uh, all the Fellini uh, movies. Um, uh, uh, the melody is the backbone that drives the, the drama and the action and puts the personality on the move. And um, on the other side, Bernard Herrmann 
um, is you can use a three notes, sometimes two notes, two two, two chords uh, to create a uh, uh, an atmosphere of imbalance, an atmosphere of uh, of psychological um, dilemma, and um, and he rarely, rarely relies on a melody, and he relies on textures and repeated. Um, the chord changes, and he—it's he, equally it's effective, um, but um, it underlines the um, you know two big uh, avenues you can uh, you can traverse to get to uh, to the end with um, your, your your director that you're working with. Yeah. You know, it's interesting so, so, because... So uh, if I would, uh, I would teach, I would show the, the, those examples as a, as a vehicle, as a, as a, as a testament that uh, you don't have to do something one way. You know, sometimes you can uh, blow it apart completely and do really unexpected things like I, I did in... Uh, Drugstore Cowboy, for example, or in the, yeah. sometimes Butcher Boy and sometimes Titus. Uh, and, um, yeah, so, so, uh, you know, if I, I, I think about you know, my own uh, uh, scoring, you know, it's a matter of scoring every moment that you have in, in a movie like Batman Forever or, uh, you know, something like that. It's a big um, uh, franchise movie, and every moment, every turn, every every gesture, every you know explosion, every chase, everything has to be uh, covered. And uh, uh, dialogue, dialogue um, is rattling on, and you have to still compose and still hear the dialogue. So that's a completely other. Uh, Avenue uh, of uh, of expression, a composer has to uh, be a uh, uh, you know con- con- cognizant of and uh, have chops in that area. 